Aloha. This is Roger Brewer with the Hawaii Department of Health. This is a recording of a presentation I gave to US EPA PCB coordinators on August 30th, 2018, entitled Use of Decision Unit and multi increment Sampling Methods to Investigate, Remediate, and Dispose of PCB Contaminated Soil. This is part one to be entitled YDUMIS, or also known as IS, or Incremental Sampling, Incremental Sampling Methodology, as several names is needed. I'd like to quote at the bottom of the, the slide here by Albert Einstein, if I had one hour to solve the problems of the world, I would spend 59 minutes on explaining the problem and one minute on explaining the answer. That's really what, gonna, what we're going to do in part one. That we're going to review a case study, but I'm also going to focus on some of the problems we've had with discrete soil sample data reliability. And we'll look at a field study where we investigated what the cause of that was. Some quick references. This is the Hawaii DUMIS guidance. I'll be using this term throughout the, the webinar. Uh, just entitled Technical Guidance Manual. It was first published in 2009. We updated it in 2016. So sections 3, 4, 5, and 8 uh, focus on field and site investigations, specifically soil sampling and also sediment sampling. Section 3 discusses systematic planning for how to design a site investigation with a, a big focus on what we refer to as decision units. We'll be talking about that some in this webinar, especially in part two of this series. Section four discusses how D decision units or DUs can be characterized once you define an area. This might be a yard, like an exposure area, or it might be an area where you suspect a spill has happened. So there's a short discussion of sampling theory for a particulate matter like soil, and also a discussion of discrete soil sampling methods versus multi-increment sampling methods. And that's what we'll be focusing on today. Section 5 of the guidance uh, reviews field implementation or how you carry out the designation of DUs and collection of samples in the field. We discuss in a lot of detail about different tools for different soil types. You know, it's intended to be very practical and based on our own experience. Uh, Hawaii is one of the few states where the, the agency, environmental agency, in this case the Department of Health, has its own internal field team. So we go out and do our own field work every year. So we learn what works and what doesn't work. In Section A, the guidance just discusses field screening tools. One of our favorite tools when available is a portable XRF for looking at metal contaminated sites to help us very quickly in the field identify areas of elevated contamination for further characterization. We also have a six-part DUMIS training webinar series posted to our YouTube channel. You can see the the address below, or you can just go to YouTube, type in Hawaii here, H-E-E-R, and by D-U-M-I-S, something like that, and you'll find the six-part webinar series. So these go into a lot of detail about each one of the different steps in the site investigation noted above, and also there's uh, number six in the series discusses what we call environmental hazard evaluations where we, or risk assessments and how screening levels and such are developed for use in DUMIS investigations. I'll be talking about a field study we carried out in 2012, 13, and 14. Uh, we, all, we published a two-part paper on the field study where we looked at the at reliability of discrete soil samples. Part one of the study just presents the field study results, so it's a lot of data. We're hoping that people will look at this data and expand on the discussion that we gave in the paper. Part two of the study discusses implications of what we saw as uncertainty and discrete sample reliability, which we'll be talking about quite a bit now. Again, on our uh, YouTube webpage, you can find a webinar related to this field study posted. And the full field report and links to the recorded webinars are posted to our here webpage. The presentation outline said so in part one today, we're gonna, I'll introduce our case study. It's uh, in the town of Maili in Hawaii on Oahu. It's former Voice of America broadcasting, radio broadcasting station. So I'll go over the background of the, the broadcasting station and the investigations that have been carried out there. So in the past, I'll review the past uh, DU MIS investigations and also discrete sample investigations carried it out at the site. This is one of the sites we used in our published field study of discrete sample data variability and reliability and the implications. And then we'll end up the webinar looking at the 
the VOA site, Voice of America site, and the remedial investigation that was carried out this summer, and it's being completed now. And we won't go into detail, but just introduce you to some of the ideas of designating DUs to design a remedial investigation. Part two of the webinar, which will be later this year, uh, we'll go into more detail on the Voice of America site remediation. We'll look at uh, how their decision units that they designated this summer worked out as far as remediation goes. What would they do differently? We'll go through the progression of remediation. They're excavating soil, collecting uh, confirmation samples, DU, MIS confirmation samples from different areas that were excavated. And we'll also look at the designation of additional decision units for final confirmation of the site or of cleanup and the site was, is going to be redeveloped for residential land use in the future. One thing for people new to this, as I was, it's been 10 years ago now, but I've been collecting discrete soil samples myself at sites and relying on them for 10 years before that. And we always knew something was wrong in the field when we were doing this. What if I move my sample over a few feet? Would I get the same number? And is this really the best way to do it? But we did, at the time, we just didn't know of any alternatives. But we all go through these same five stages of sampling grief. So, so a lot of what you hear me maybe joking about is a lot of that's toward myself, not necessarily toward the audience. So the five stages of grief, you know, denial, anger, depression, we all go through that initially when we start realizing that you know, the way we were collecting samples with discrete samples in the past, it probably wasn't as reliable. Well, it wasn't reliable as we thought it was and some of the problems that we had. And sites I think of I worked on where we collected hundreds of discrete samples for PCBs. And even after that, and after two or three years of going back and forth, back and forth, still really couldn't figure out what was going on there. Well, now we know why. So I, I still get a little depressed about that sometimes. But, you know, we did the best we could. At that particular site, the developer who was ready to build houses just kicked us off the site and stripped off the top two or three feet of soil and got rid of it just to save time and they spent so much money on this site. So the, the fourth stage in the five stages of sampling grief is compromise or bargaining. So this is a, a dangerous stage to get to. It's, it's pretty easy to get to this stage it, once you get out in the field and actually see how the samples are collected but or even just understanding it in a workshop. But it's, it's very easy to think, well, okay, this multi-increment sampling, incremental sampling method methodology it's probably good for some cases or some scenarios, and discrete samples are good for others. Well, something we'll discuss today is that's not really the case at all. This, the whole approach with sampling theory and DUMIS and ISM and such, was it's intended to, to take the place of discrete sampling methods and to address problems we've always had in the past. So there's no real compromise. Now, I'd still challenge anyone to, to give me a site where they think discrete sample data were adequate, knowing what they know now to get in and get out investigating and cleaning up the site. So that it's really important to, to move on to the acceptance stage where you just you know don't look behind you at the sites we closed in the past. We did the best we could. And mainly we just wasted a lot of time and money. We, at some sites we may have left some stuff behind. And just move forward. So here's our case study we'll be discussing today as part of our field studies. Again, former Voice of America broadcasting station is owned by the Navy. 80-acre site is controlled by the Coast Guard. You can see in this the photograph in the upper left-hand corner, I have circled in red where the broadcasting station was. The larger area out here, most of the 80 acres, were where the radio towers were. So the, about five acres of the site was used as a broadcasting station. It operated from 1944 to 1969, and then it was abandoned in 1969, and the, the entire area was unused since then. Now, most more recently, the property has been deeded over to, I think it's the Department of Hawaiian Homeland to, for residential redevelopment, and there's a strong suspicion these broadcasting stations are known to be contaminated with PCBs, so they, they investigated the entire area. Didn't find much in the 80-acre portion of the site where the towers were, but you'll see in a minute they found a lot of PCBs around the broadcasting station. Here's the back part of the station. You can see some electrical equipment that's up against up against the building. And on the previous slide I showed some uh, a note where the, the big substations and such were that were used to run the, the broadcasting station. So if you're not familiar with electrical equipment, these this equipment's filled with with uh, dielectric oil, which in the past would, they use PCBs, especially as a, a flame retardant. So you don't have to worry about them blowing up. And every few years, the oil need to be changed. 
So in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, what you would do with the oil, it, in this case, is probably take it out and just dump it on the ground, or in some cases they used it for dust suppression on roads and such. So in 2011, when the, the property they knew was going to be deeded over and redeveloped for residential use, uh, a, a large-scale DUMIS investigation was carried out at the entire site. Again, we've been using DUMIS methods in Hawaii since 2004 is when we started our guidance published in 2009, so it was already well known that we could rely on discrete sample data. Now this investigation, again, they didn't find much out in the, the, the big area of the site where the radio towers were. You can see outlined in red here the five acre site area where the, the broadcasting station was. They collected a single multi-increment sample, probably from 30 points. At the time we didn't really know any better, didn't realize you need a lot more points or increments than that for PCBs. And they d identified 15 ppm PCBs in the sample. So they knew they had a problem there somewhere. So if you're not familiar with multi-increment sampling methods, the first thing you do is define a very specific area uh, where you want to collect a sample. Again, it could be your backyard, it could be a spill area. In this case, this property is being developed, split up into very large parcels with houses put in each parcel. So we, they considered each parcel as a decision it so it could be several acres, say four or five acres each. It's only one sample per site. We'll look at that more later on. So zooming in on the five acre site area where the broadcasting station was, the next step was they split this area up into five smaller decision units. So around uh, you know one acre, a little bit more than an acre each. <coughs> and they collected again a single uh, MIS sample in each one of these decision units. I believe in one of them by this time they would have collected replicates. They would have collected three completely independent samples and compared the results just to get an idea of how precise the data were. So one thing that popped up immediately here, look at the, the numbers, concentrations in the DUs. You'd expect one of the areas to be much higher than 15 ppm if, if you think the PCBs are concentrated in one place you know, from the earlier single sample. The highest concentration they got this time was 2.6 milligrams per kilogram around this station itself where you would expect most of the PCB contamination. <coughs> so this throws up a red flag immediately. We actually weren't that surprised that even with MIS data something is, is going on. <coughs> so the next thing they did at this station is they, and this is actually pretty rare for DUMIS investigations, but this site was so large, it was five acres, they wanted to get a better idea of where the PCBs were because it wasn't really obvious. They, they had some ideas. So in this case, they put in, they collected hundreds of discrete samples uh, across the site in the main area of concern, which we, even in our guidance, we have a whole section on how to use discrete sample data, discrete sampling methods. It's initial screening. We don't trust individual points, but they can be very useful for identifying large scale patterns. So in this case, at every dot, they collected one sample at the surface, zero to four feet, and they dug a hole and collected another discrete sample at two feet and keep, kept digging and dug, collected another one at four feet. They tested all these samples using immunoassay kits, a lot cheaper. They, they weren't going to send them to a laboratory. It would have cost a fortune. So you can see here, it, there does appear to be a, a large scale pattern. All the yellow, which in this case is greater than one ppm PCBs. And you see in the center part we have the reds and blues and such much, this just indicates deeper contamination. This also happens to be where the higher concentrations were identified. So the, the discrete samples did a pretty good job of identifying the core area of contamination. But we'll see in, in a while, you can't really trust the boundaries that much. Now something that jumps out here are all these individual, what look like isolated hot spots. And if, if you go back and look at the webinar from our, our main field study, this throws up a big red flag anytime you start finding isolated hot spots. Chances are you didn't miraculously find some little spot where someone 40 or 50 years ago dumped some PCB uh, contaminated oil onto the ground. What this is indicating is a lot of heterogeneity in the soil. So any of these spots you'll see in a minute to move over six inches or a foot, you could get a completely different number. So this just means that there's little nuggets or little, little patches of highly contaminated soil scattered all throughout this area around the, the central hot area. <coughs>
So this was the data for the discrete samples that had greater than 1 ppm PCBs. Here's the data for the PCB samples that had greater than 50 ppm PCBs. You know, they wanted this information for future disposal. Well now the, you still see a, some idea of a central core area. So that's probably true, the heaviest contamination, but now you see a lot more of these isolated hot spots around here. So these are, and I'll show you again in a minute, these are completely artificial. It, it just means that the soil outside of the core area here has lots of uh, tiny patches of heavy contamination mixed with soil with less contamination. So if you retested it from slightly different areas, you'd see a similar pattern. Lots of little hot spots around a core area, but the spots would be in different areas. If you weren't really aware of what's going on, that could be really confusing. So think about this too, digging up these individual hot spots, would that make any sense? So this, this set off the idea for our study. In our office gets funded through US EPA Region 9. Every year we take 5 or 10% of our funding and do some type of field research. We were always seeing these problems out at this site, so we, we identified this as a great one to do more detailed study. So ever wonder, which we all have I think, is what if I move my discrete sample point over a few feet? Would I get the same number? What if the lab test a different aliquot or subsample of soil. So typically a laboratory, when you send them your jar of soil, or whatever, they just open the top and they take out a pinch. Literally a, a small pinch of soil is what they test for metals. For VOCs, they test five grams for PCBs, pesticides, and such. Maybe a small spoonful, 10 to 30 grams, but not much. But if they tested another pinch of soil, another little spoonful of soil, would they get the same concentration in that sample? We'll find out. So that, we thought about the same thing, so we set up this discrete soil sample variability field study. We picked three sites in Hawaii we knew were contaminated. Uh, site A was a site on the Big Island contaminated with arsenic. And this was arsenic from wastewater and fine-grained soils. So we expected the, the variability within dis, you know, closely located discrete samples and within individual discrete samples to be fairly low at this site. If it was going to be low anywhere, <coughs> it would, should be low here. Site B was a site is contaminated with lead and uh, lead contaminated incinerator ashes mixed with fill material around a few former municipal incinerator. You can see the building in the background in the middle here. So we expected to see an increase in discrete sample variability here because you'd have little patches of ash mixed in with the soil, higher concentration in some areas and less in others. And then we have study site C, the PCB transform oil that I just introduced. But we already knew that we, uh, we consistently have a lot of problems with discrete soil samples for PCBs where confirmation samples don't make sense, and co-located samples don't make sense, and laboratory replicates can be completely different. So here's what we did at each one of these sites, just focusing on the Voice of America site. At each site we set up 24 grid points, and we, we kept the site the investigation area is fairly small, kind of representing of a, maybe an exposure area, in this case 60 by 120 feet, 7200 square feet. Each one of the individual points you can see in the upper left hand photograph. Then we put a flag in the middle, then we collected five discrete samples within a one square meter area around that flag or around that grid point. And we tested each one of those independently at the lab without any processing. We put these in bags, but they would open up the bag like they normally would and just take out 10 grams and test it. So we also, at all these sites, all the grid points also, if you look at the same photograph, you see all these small jars around the flag. We took one sample a discrete sample, but this time we split it up into 10 different portions and we put a little portion in each one of these 10 jars. We had the lab test every jar. So this would replicate testing a single discrete sample 10 times. And then we could look at the variability of PCBs within a single discrete sample. We did our study on the, in the lower left hand corner on the side of the broadcasting station where we already knew ahead of time from the former discrete sampling study and, and such and just the site scenario. This is probably where most of the PCB contamination would be. Also, within our target area here, we collected three multi-increment samples. And I'll show you those uh, in a later on in the webinar. So we, we, picked, we put a 60-point grid across this area, evenly spaced points. And then we collected a small mass of soil, about 50 grams at each one of those points, combined it all together into one big sample. And then we went back and did that three times from completely independent areas so we can compare the data one sample for this area. Well, Here's what we found in the discrete samples. First we look at 
variability within a sample where we put split the sample up into 10 parts in 10 different jars have the lab test each soil from each jar we call refer to this as intra sample variability so this is one of the actual grid points here so here at sample data one sample tested 10 times the variability in PC PCB concentrations range from a low of 810 milligrams per kilogram to almost an order of magnitude more 5700 milligrams per kilogram so almost an order of magnitude variability now we see the same variability I'll show you in just a, in a minute uh, even with lower concentrations you know below 1 ppm or just a few ppm so you'd see the same variability regardless of the concentration the average of this sample keep this in mind 2400 ppm this was actually one of the good points at the site where we saw lower variability around an individual within an individual sample the average variability within our discrete soil samples tested 10 times again was 17 fold maximum variability where they tested 10 subsamples from one jar or one sample over two orders of magnitude so think about that you know, what's that data you get back from the laboratory actually represent here's the the same grid point now we're looking at inter sample variability or co-located samples around the, the same point again so you see the five discrete samples collected around the center of the point here had a low concentration of 4.9 ppm and then just two feet away 91 ppm and you see the other concentrations were in between and then there's the a true hot spot where we collected our single sample and tested it ten times the average was 2400 ppm so here you're looking at almost 400 fold variability within discrete samples around a single grid point so it, this is a key point a, a you know, bit of enlightenment that we had is your the concentration you get in a discrete sample collected in a single spot is completely random within some unknown range of, of a potential and you'll see this PCB concentration here it's 4.9 ppm in the center point here you move to the lower right it goes up to 91 that doesn't mean that the PCB concentrations are increasing in that area like you might see in an ISO concentration map it's completely random if we went past the 91 ppm sample collected another one another sample it might be in D or it might be 3000 ppm you don't know this this draws into a lot of questions about the reliability of ISO concentration maps for for soil data which start looking at those you'll, if you start seeing lots of you'll see large scale patterns they're probably right when you start seeing lots of isolated hot spots and cold spots you're dealing with heterogeneity and those are completely artificial patterns so we saw again a similar magnitude of variability for both high and low concentrations of PCBs in the soil in this set of box plots the, the y-axis on the left is just the concentration of PCBs this is a log scale and then here we have our 24 box plots one for each sample and again you can see the variability within individual samples easily one or two orders of magnitude and some of the samples three orders of magnitude so think about the the implications of that now on in on average if you look at the variability within the samples at this site and you look at the variability within the discrete samples around a grid point then the the median variability for PCB concentrations and discrete samples collected at any point in this site is about 39 fold or about 40 fold so that means you can go to any point within this site on average at, and collect discrete samples within one square meter area around the grid point and the PCB concentrations are going to vary by uh, well over an order of magnitude in some cases again we saw two or three orders of magnitude variability so what does it really mean here and we've plotted on our cleanup level for the site 1.2 ppm again around individual grid points at a lot of the points there you can find you'll find a discrete sample if you collect enough it's above 1.2 ppm and above uh, below 1.2 ppm same thing for 50 ppm so again what is the discrete sample telling you how reliable is it just think about the implications well what's going on at this site well, we got curious we bought a microscope and looked at the soil in detail one thing we noticed starting on the bottom left here you see all these dark fragments dark particles here these are pieces of basalt rock but we noticed that some of these fragments if you just push on them a little bit would easily crumble you see it here in the in the middle picture about on average about two millimeters in size then we zoomed in more and looked at some of these particles here and you see it here on the left it looks like a, a, a tic tac or if you're from a tropical area it, to me it first thing it reminded me of is a roach egg they're pretty round 
and in the soil. And look at this white rim. Keep that in mind. We would see that consistently around all these these little uh, roach eggs, or what do you want to call them here. What we realize, w what these probably are, is they're PCB-infused tar balls. It's where the PCB oil sank when it spilled on the ground. It coalesced into droplets, and the droplets sank into the soil or absorbed the soil into them. So they're kind of fossil tar balls. Now this has some huge implications with respect to what does concentration mean from discrete samples. So uh, the key point here is that concentration varies with the mass of the volume of soil tested. If we tested on the bottom right again this entire sample of soil as a you know a single sample, they, if they could extract the whole sample, then they get they get a pretty low concentration of PCBs if there was only one small nugget in there. Now think about that back up to the top left. If we took one of these little nuggets or these little tar balls, PCB infused tar balls and tested it, the concentration would be really high, probably hundreds of ppm PCBs or even thousands of ppm PCBs. Now if we zoomed into one of these tar balls, if we had an electron microprobe that could actually detect and give you a concentration of PCBs, at some point you hit a small enough spot within these tar balls where the concentration of PCBs is going to be one million parts per million. It's just pure PCBs. So that was a, an epiphany we had during this study. A common question we used to have when we were d still doing discrete soil sampling was what's the maximum concentration of say PCBs at a site? That's actually a really easy question to answer now. If they're absent, if there are no PCBs in the soil, if the maximum concentration is 0%. If PCBs are present in the soil, then the maximum concentration is 100% if you could focus in on a small enough particle. So that's a, this is a key concept in sampling theory, which for really for the past 30 years has been pretty absent in the environmental work, is that the you have to define the mass and the volume of, of soil that you want a, a concentration for up front and then collect a representative sample from that. That, this, that target mass or volume of soil or area of soil is referred to as a decision. It, the objective is always to get the true or mean concentration for that specified volume and area of soil as if you could test the entire targeted area as a single sample. We'll look at that again in a minute. This is interesting that one of the chemists, the consultant that helped us with the, this field work, we were pondering how could these nuggets have formed. He said, oh, it's easy. Just go get some olive oil and pour it on dry flour and watch what happens. So I did this at home and then immediately the olive oil will beat up on the flour. And then you see in the, the bottom left-hand corner here, you just watch. The, you can watch the olive oil droplet slowly sink into the flour. It's really, it's absorbing the flour. It's kind of sucking it into it and sinking down. And then look what happens. Here's this thin, outer, light-colored rim where there's more flour, in this case, than there is olive oil. And this is just an olive oil-saturated uh, nugget within the, the flour. Now then take the flour and sieve it, and look what you get. All these little olive oil-infused nuggets in your flour. So if you had a big barrel of flour with olive oil, somebody dumped olive oil in it, and you took, start taking random samples, you get really high concentrations of olive oil in some of the samples and nothing in the others, depending on whether or not these nuggets are present or how many of them in your the sam subsample you test. That was really interesting. So think about the implications of this. And again, something, something I did quite a bit in the past when I was doing PCB sites back in the, in the 90s and early 2000s. So I'll, you see all these isolated hot spots again in the past, we might have gone and tried to dig out these hot spots, you know, small areas, just maybe a few square meters, and then collect confirmation samples around the edge. And you start keep going on and on and on until you eventually you're going to hit a clean spot. And you have to, and you'll think you're done. In reality, what's happening is this entire area around the core area with heavy contamination is just full of these little nuggets of PCBs, infused tar balls. If, if you went back to any one of these spots, and collected enough discrete samples, probably just five or so, then you'd see a similar pattern. But some of the hot spots you see now would disappear, and then some of the where you didn't have greater than 50 ppm, you'd see these hot spots pop up there. So think about that. It's really completely random that you're getting these, and all it's telling you is you have a lot of, of heterogeneity in the, soil at the site at the scale of a discrete sample. So you use discrete samples at your own risk is one of the lessons we had. And again, we still use discrete sample data when available, not so much now to help designate areas for testing.
but we know better now about relying on single individual samples. Here's the same site, variability of PCBs in co-located samples. Here's our 24 grid points. Here we're looking, say you're looking for PCBs greater than 1.2 ppm, our cleanup level. The red dots here indicate grid points where if you collected discrete samples around those points, chances are all the discrete samples are going to be above 1.2 ppm. So using that low of a number, it kind of can't fail. The yellow spots, however, where around these grid points, we've, we have discrete soil sample data that's below and above 1.2 ppm, so it's completely random uh, the concentration you would get for any one of those discrete sample, or these individual grid points. And then the green spots, these seem to be consistently clean within the area where all the discrete samples collected from here and the range we estimated for around those grid points was always below 1.2 ppm. So large scale pattern, you can see something there, it, it's useful, it makes sense, you just can't rely on individual points. Here's what it looks like though for the PCBs greater than, greater than 50 ppm. And in this case, now you've really got a problem if you're relying on discrete soil sample data. Almost only one of the samples here, one of the grid points, did we see consistently the discrete soil samples collected around at greater than 50 ppm. All these yellow points, almost half the, the grid points in the area we tested, you could find a discrete sample below 50 ppm and above 50 ppm. So what does that really mean anyway? This 50 ppm and an individual grid point, this is where a, a second important concept here is you have to really think what does your screening level mean? What, what's it intended to be used for? Are we really worried about finding every small tarball, PCB infused tarball at, in the soil at this site? Well, you're never going to do that, of course. Or should we be looking at the big picture? And if we assume this was an exposure area, we just want one concentration of PCBs for the exposure area, and that's what we compare to screening levels using a risk assessment. And that's what the screening levels were intended to use. They were never intended, uh, the US EPA RSLs were never intended to be applied to individual discrete sample points. They were always intended to be applied to targeted exposure areas. <coughs> this is why confirmation samples fail or pass. It is starting to be obvious now. It's all due to small scale, random variability of contaminant concentrations over a few inches of feet. Now in other webinars I give on this, one of my favorite pictures someone gave me is a, it's a cartoon of an elephant with someone on the elephant's back with a microscope and they're trying to guess what the elephant is or it's a bird or it's a, it's a, a brush or something. That's the problem with discrete soil samples. You're, you're too close to the soil. You're testing too small of a mass or a volume of soil to be able to make any sense of it. You're, you're lost in heterogeneity. You'll get a number, yeah, but you know, the number is not going to be reliable. It's not really going to mean much. And it's not it's not addressing what your key question is. And that number you get is going to be largely random within some unknown range. So the, the epiphany we had here is that you know, your lab data that you get back from discrete samples is not going to be reliably representative of that sample. And no lab would ever tell you that it is, not honestly anyway. If they do tell you that, just have them test 10 more aliquots and let's see how close they are. And also the sample you collected is not going to be reliably representative of the area where it was collected. Now again, we did three different study sites. This was the worst site, the PCBs. The arsenic site was the best, as we expected. The variability we saw around individual grid points there on average was only twofold. And it's funny, I, we were talking to some risk assessors about this, and we showed them that first, and they panicked. They're like, well, is it, was it 50 ppm or 100 ppm? What's the answer? Now, our answer was, wow, that's the best you ever be able to do at a site with discrete samples for single points. The variability at the lead site was, on average, I think about sevenfold or close to an order of magnitude variability around any individual grid, grid points. Again, for the PCB site, you're looking at 39-fold on average, and then some grid points much higher than that. So this problem, it can't be fixed by collecting more and more discrete samples, which I've certainly done in the past. Just keep collecting more and get more. You dig yourself deeper and deeper into the hole, because again, the number is going to be random wherever you collect that sample. Where contamination you thought was there, and you go back and retest it, suddenly it's gone. That's what you're dealing with. Or there's nothing there and someone else retest it in the future and suddenly they find something. You also, statistics can't solve this problem for you. That's a common mistake made by a lot of people by myself in the past who didn't understand statistics much until I started studying sampling theory and talking with statisticians. And we'll talk about this more in, in a minute. But doing a statistical analysis of a discrete sample set doesn't fix your problem. It's the same idea, garbage in, garbage out. This is what soil contamination would look like if you could actually see it, especially I think PCBs. On the left is Jackson Pollock. 
my favorite painters because it's just chaos. He just takes paint and splatters it on a, a canvas. Uh, the zoom in picture, that red spot you see here is about the size of what a discrete sample would be. It's the, about the size of his foot. So just imagine moving this around. This is only a, you know, maybe a one or two foot square area. Move that red dot around and just think of the very building concentrations you would get for it within that whole area. That's what we're seeing with PCBs in soil. On the right hand picture is a milk truck that it flipped over and look at the milk that ran down through the soil just picking preferential pathways. Imagine you couldn't see the milk. Maybe this was PCE or something. And say so you couldn't smell it either. So, and you had money for five samples. Something like this was typical in my consulting days. Imagine going out here blind and collecting five discrete samples within this area. Where do you think it went? Well, you'd find some. Some of them you wouldn't find anything, and maybe three of them or so you would find milk. And you think, oh, we found the main part of it. There's a good chance you completely missed the main part of the contamination. All right. Either way, you'd be there for a long time with your confirmation samples where you kept finding more and thinking it was clean. It turned out to be dirty. This is also on the right-hand corner is what we think contamination in subsurface looks like if this truck was a leaking tank. This is probably how leaking gasoline or PCE and solvents move through soil. It's not a nice uh, single color plume like you'd see in isoconcentration maps. It's probably anastomosing following preferential pathways, which is why the data within discrete sample data within boreholes can look so confusing. And again, in our guidance, we have a, a completely separate discussion on how to collect soil samples from single boreholes. It's not just from a single point. You define a targeted layer interval, collect a large sample across that entire interval, and test it. So how did this happen? So Dina Crumley with the US EPA headquarters went back and, and tracked down some of the original guidance that was used to develop discrete sampling methods back in the 1980s. And I'd point out, uh, I don't think I mentioned it before, but the other sampling intensive industries are farming and mining, mineral exploration. They would never use discrete soil samples. They were up until about the 1950s when Pierre G, they realized they had huge problems. They thought they found a gold deposit and they s spent millions of dollars setting up some operation only to find out there was nothing there. Or a farmer's test his field and thinks the nutrient levels are fine and all the crops die. They realized it was a sampling problem. And they developed a completely separate method for uh, collecting soil samples. But in the environmental industry at that time was unaware of this. It was mostly wastewater engineers, people familiar with that type of contamination, developed the guidance. And in that case, if you're dealing with wastewater, it's pretty consistent. So they assumed the same was a similar for soil, since they, since they contaminate with the liquid. So here's some of the quotes. The implicit assumption that contamination is likely to be uniformly present anywhere within the sampling area is reasonable. Uh, the PCB level is assumed to be uniform within a contaminated zone or spill area and zero outside of it. From US EPA 1985 verification of PCB spill cleanup. This is actually the basis of TSCA regulations. It's actually the basis of discrete soil sampling in general for US EPA since the 1980s. 1989 methods for evaluating the attainment of cleanup standards where they, they start talking about the idea of but this discrete sample data is not making much sense. And they, were, they knew it may not be reliable. So what do you do? Well, let's, let's run it through a statistical test and calculate a 95% UCL and use that to make decisions just to be safe, which you'll see in a minute wasn't so safe. But same thing there. When there's little distance between points, it's expected that there will be little variability between points. And now we, we realize that wasn't true. And, you know, there are a lot of people warning this even in the late 80s and early 90s. And we discussed this in the the paper we published is a supplement to it. We quote a lot of the original research done warning against this, and this potential problem could happen. So that brings up the question then, we definitely have a problem for site investigation, trying to test a spoonful of dirt at a time and determine the extent of contamination. So you might think, well, I can rely on discrete soil sample data for use in risk assessment, right? Again, here's the study area. This is about two or three acres now. Here's where they collected all the discrete samples. You can see here I outlined the area of our the Department of Health study uh, site investigation or investigation. This is about 7,000 square feet. Let's say they were going to take these, this two or three acre area here and put houses on it. You might split the area up into say 5,000 square foot house lots. And then you're going to test each house lot and estimate PCB concentration term if it needs to be cleaned up. But can you do that with discrete samples? Let's look and see what would happen. So 
so in this case, from a risk assessment standpoint, the goal is to estimate the true or the mean contaminant concentration for a designated area and volume of soil. Again, ideally, if it was your yard, the best thing you can do is, if you want to know what the concentration of PCBs or lead or anything is, is take off all of the soil, say the top two or four or six inches, excavate all that soil, send it to the laboratory for extraction and testing as a single sample. So they're going to extract all of it. That's the best you can do. Well, we know that you can't do that in, in practice, not usually, but there's some exceptions to that if it's a very small amount of soil. You usually can't do that. So the next option then is to, it, it was the discrete soil sampling method, again, it was developed by the environmental industry or regulators in the 1980s. So in this, in this case, uh, statistical tests are carried out on a single set of discrete samples and you calculate a 95% UCL. We're all used to that. Well, how many samples should I collect? So that if you look at some of the guidance, that say pro-UCL guidance and such, it's say, well, a minimum of eight and typically maybe up to 30. Well, in reality, what, what happens in the field? How many samples should I collect? Well, what's my budget? So you take your budget for laboratory analysis, you divide it by the analytical cost, and that's how many samples you can afford to collect at the site. That's the way most of it's done. There's no minimum requirement on the, the mass of the sample collected. Should I just collect a, a pinch, of sh pinch of soil or a, a big handful of soil or a bucket of soil and how much soil should the lab be testing? It's not discussed because at the time they didn't understand this, how to test soils. There's no requirement on laboratory processing of samples to get a representative subsample to test. So, so the laboratories instead, and they don't get paid to do anything else, they just take the top of the jar off and take out a pinch of soil. Maybe they try to homogenize it, and that is one of the laboratory techs told me, try doing that. Get a jar of dirt and stick a metal rod in it and try to stir it around. And as he pointed out, this whole idea of homogenizing a soil sample is a, is a farce that the labs have already known, but that's what they get paid to do and told to do, so they do that. So really any data you get back from the laboratory is just random for that individual sample. The other option then for collecting representative samples from this targeted area is multi-increment sampling is the term we use. And this is based on Pierre G's sampling theory for infinite particles developed for the mining industry used by the agriculture industry too. Where in this case a single sample of soil is collected from a large number of points. We call each individual point you collect a small increment of soil, a small mass. It's all combined together into a single sample. It's from collected from a, a well thought out targeted area we refer to as a decision unit. In this case, the minimum mass of soil, it's a key part of collecting soil samples, is based on what's known as fundamental error. So this, these are equations based on reviews, statistical reviews of databases for, for soil and other particulate matter that based on the grain size of the soil, the particle shape, the density, the target concentration you think you're dealing with, and other factors that actually you calculate the mass of soil you need to test. Same thing for laboratory processing. Uh, this very strict laboratory processing requirements I'll show you in a minute that designates the minimum mass of soil you need to collect from a processed sample, which is 10 grams, the minimum. Definitely not one gram like it's typical for metals, but just due to particle size and such, minimum 10 grams, ideally up to 30 or 50 is even better. So these first four bullets here replicate what's done with discrete sampling. So all the statistics is built into the sampling method and based on, again, on sampling theory. Another additional thing you can do with multi-increment samples is you can go back to the same areas which we actually require that you do at sites and some of your decision units. You can collect additional samples from a single targeted area, referred to as replicate samples, and then compare the difference between the different samples you collected. You can assess the precision of the sample collection method in total as needed, as desired. Again, we typically require that people collect three separate replicate samples, or three samples total from 10% of the targeted areas in a site investigation just to verify that their sampling method is, is producing good precision. So let's look at the VOA study site now, back to discrete sample sets or discrete samples reliable. In this case, we have these 24 points at the, at the study site. Let's do this. We took, uh, we took we selected 10 random points within those 24, as if someone went out and just randomly collected 10 samples from that area. And then we looked at the range of PCB concentrations within that grid for that particular uh, grid point. We randomly picked a concentration from that. And then we calculated 
UCL using US EPA's Pro UCL for that particular set of samples. We did it 20 times. So with just 20 iterations, testing 10 random points within this targeted area, we see PCB concentrations, 95% UCL ranging from 9.4 ppm to 1,000 greater than 1, sorry, greater than 1 million ppm. So match at this site, and this is completely real, if 20 people went out each, and each of them collected, uh, ran very randomly collected 10 separate samples from that targeted area and calculated 95% UCL, this is what we'd expect them to get. They'd get UCLs within that range. So, you know, what does a single UCL mean for this site? Not much. What if we took all 24 grid points at a site? And so that's the best we could do with our data. But still, within e at each grid point, we have a, a range of PCB concentrations we estimated for discrete samples around that grid point. Now we're going to pick a random concentration within that range for each grid point. And now we have a 24-point discrete sample set to calculate 95% UCL. In this case, uh, the range is, is a lot tighter, but still... 20 iterations, again 20, 20 people collecting these samples, we get a range of UCLs from low of 652 ppm to over 8,000 ppm, so an over an order magnitude difference, again even with 24 discrete samples from here. This is never done in, in reality, you only collect one set of discrete samples and you're doing this because nobody has the money to collect you know, more than one set in most cases. So think about what does this mean? And that's, this is why statistics can't help you with this, running it on one set of sample. Imagine if you went to a, a movie theater, grocery, a big store or something, a thousand people there. You randomly pick a hundred people and you ask their age. And you want to calculate, the, you want to estimate the mean age of all the people in that group. So one person goes in and asks everyone their age and they can calculate it, the mean and 95% UCL estimated age range or age, mean age for the group. Then someone else goes back in to the same 100 people and asks them what their age is again and does it. But this time, the, the people give them a different age. So, and then we do that, 20 people go and do this survey, and every time they ask these same people what their age is, they get a different age. And so you get a really wide variability in your 95% UCL. So what can you do here with this? It, statistics can't help you in this, and it's a big problem, even with soil vapor testing and such, small volumes. It's a big issue with US EPA's vapor intrusion empirical database. The data, you can't do anything. If that's the case and you realize that's the case and any individual data point is unverifiable, unreliable, then you're done. The database can't be used. So how many discrete data points are enough within some targeted area? Well, I don't know. Uh, again, you know, the site, our arsenic site, we had low heterogeneity. We actually got pretty good reproducibility with 24 data points, and it matched up fairly well with our multi sampling data. So you can estimate a reliable 95% UCL mean with uh, discrete samples, but how are you going to know it's reliable unless you do more than once? It has to be very low heterogeneity. So the data used in the original US EPA guidance that called for collecting 20 to 30 discrete samples in the 1980s, we could never find it. It had to be a low heterogeneity site, you know, low heterogeneity site conditions based on our own research similar to our arsenic site because most of the sites we look at with just 20 to 30 discrete samples you're not going to get reliable data. If someone else collected another set of 20 to 30 samples their UCL or their mean could be much higher or lower. So 95% UCL calculated for a single set of discrete samples uh, this could be shocking to my risk assessors friends including me to have a background risk assessment is a, is a random value within an unknown range. And that's a fact. It's not, it's not an opinion. Now, the precision reproducibility of this, any 95% UCL for a single set of discrete samples, it's never tested. We never test, bothered to test this in the past. And it's unknown. Uh, so a key point a statistician made when I was talking with him is that, that you know, 95% UCL only describes <coughs> the precision of the statistical test employed to estimate a mean for the data provided, the data set provided. It doesn't tell you anything about the representative of that single data set. That's always going to be unknown. So statistics can't save us. So what's the solution? We're not going to go into this in detail at all, but it's Pierre G's, again, the sampling theory. There's a lot of detail. It's in, the original book is in French, written in the 1950s. If you can read French, read it. It's full of equations and statistics and such. But there is a multitude of potential errors 
in when collecting soil samples or samples of particulate matter. You can see it here: fundamental error, grouping, and segregation. I won't go through all these. It's a uh, heterogeneity within the soil, small mass of soil, compositional heterogeneity, say particle to particle, and then distributional heterogeneity across your targeted area, and such. Analytical error, preparation area, how you collect the sample. And so I won't go into this in detail. We explained it a little bit in our guidance. It's explained a little bit in ITRC's ISM guidance. Although this, in that guidance, keep in mind the group got stuck at compromise. That's why there's all this information there on discrete samples. A lot of it we now know is wrong. All the statistical analysis of databases and comparisons to multi-increment samples is it is completely wrong, not applicable. But at the time we had moved past this, the uh, the compromise stage. If you really want to understand this, the training, the best class you can take is Francis Bittard's uh, class. You see his web page there. He knew Pierre G. He wrote the book on, on sampling. Uh, a better class to take to get to the meat of it is Chuck Ramsey's class on sampling or sample representativeness. Uh, most of the consultants and all the regulators in Hawaii now have taken this class at least once. I've taken it four times. And you see his web page there. That's really the first step. He spends a lot of time kind of deep brainwashing us of, of discrete samples and talking about sampling theory in general. And also, it, again, I mentioned before, our office has a six-part webinar series in, in a lot of detail on how to set up site DUMIS investigations and discussions of sampling. There's a, an entire webinar. Webinar number three is based on or describes our field sampling study of discrete sample reliability and, and the basics of multi increment samples. I'd actually start with that and then go back and start with the first one. So a, a real sum, quick summary of what's a multi increment sample. It's pretty simple. You collect uh, The idea is to collect a, a single really big sample, minimum based on particle size, ppm concentrations and such, of one to two kilograms. Anything smaller than that's not going to be representative of that area. You have to collect it from a lot of points within your targeted area. Each point we collect what we call an increment of soil, typically uh, 30 to 50 grams. That's all combined together into one sample. A minimum 30 to 75 increments per area. We start off now with a default of 50. We used to use 30 and our replicate samples were not good at all so we bumped it up to 50. When you start work dealing with stuff like lead-based paint or paint chips or PCBs, you really have to collect your sample from at least 75 points. And you collect them within a very, uh, within a specified, well thought out decision unit area and volume of soil. Typical, a suspect soil area, you, a spill area, you draw a line around it, that's your decision unit. Collect one sample, or an exposure area in your backyard or park or something, or boundary areas where you think you're at the edge of contamination, so you draw a defined area that you hope is clean and collect a sample there. We have an entire webinar, number two, is dedicated to different types of decision units. Then, now when the, the laboratory gets this, they don't just open the bag. So now it's a big three or four or five kilogram bag of soil sometimes, and you know, grab a random pinch. They have to properly dry the air dry the sample. If it's not volatile, it's a different method for volatiles I won't get into. It's in our guidance. They air dry it, and you sieve it typically to less than two millimeters. Uh, in some cases, you might want to sieve it down to less than 250 microns or 100 microns if you were going to focus on the finer fraction. We're about to do a study for that next year. Look at the variability. And then the laboratory, once they dry it and sieve it, again, they don't just grab a random pinch and test it. The minimum, they have to collect a minimum 10 grams, and they collect it from at least 30 to 50 points from that sample when it's spread out, as you can see down the bottom right. So how do you know this, this one sample, uh, this really it's a collection of increments, is represented the site? Again, 10% of the DUs in our guidance. You have to go back and collect replicate samples, compare the the differences to look at overall precision. We call these triplicates. And you can see this is John Peard who got this started in our office collecting a, a MI sample in a, a small test plot. This is a garden that was contaminated with arsenic. And you see in the middle our three replicate samples collected from one area. Well back to study site C, the Voice of America site. Like I mentioned, we aside in addition to the discrete samples we collected, we collected MI triplicates. So we went to the same area. We collected three 60 increment multi increment samples. These probably weighed three or four kilograms. We like big samples now. They're more reliable. So look at the, the data we got. Let's start with sample C, 19 ppm. Sample B, 24 ppm PCBs. I saw these two first. First data we got, we thought, wow, we nailed this with 60 increment sample. Great data. Sample A, which is the one I happen to have collected, 
came back 270 ppm. So our sampling method wasn't appropriate, it wasn't adequate for this site. We should have collected bigger samples from more points within the area. I didn't believe the data when I got it back from the laboratory. So when your data don't make sense, what do you do? The first thing you do is you blame the laboratory. I actually paid out of my own pocket for laborator laboratory to retest all three samples again. And they got the pretty much the exact same answer. So it wasn't laboratory error with this, it was field error. You know, the mean concentration 104 ppm, that's probably about true for this site, I would think. We, if we combine all these together, the mean represents swell from 180 points within this 7,000 square foot area. I think we're getting pretty close. 95% UCL, 467 ppm, I'd completely ignore it. The RST is too high. It's a very poor precision. We wouldn't have known this if we just collected a single MI sample. We wouldn't have known it if we collected a single, say, a discrete sample. So maybe we tested every increment separately, a 60 discrete samples here. And we wouldn't have known that that wasn't uh, reliable. So the next step in this case would be to take this decision it. You either clean it up based on uh, your screening level, or what they'd probably do is we take this decision and split it up into smaller areas. Go back and look at the site in detail. Look at the dirt and see if there's any differences. And split it up into different smaller decision units. Collect bigger samples for, with, made up of more increments from each one of these smaller decision unit areas. You really want to avoid have to do doing this or to do this. Go back and retest areas and re-split them up into smaller DUs. The whole point of this approach is to get in and get out. So you want to set your decision units small enough up front that everyone's happy is going to be happy with the data and they can make a decision based on the data collected. We'll talk about that in the questions in a minute. So uh, the key point then, this, this whole approach, sampling theory, multi-increment samples, ISM, whatever you want to call it, it's not just another tool in the toolbox. It was, it's an entirely new and improved set of tools. Think of it that way. So these DUMIS investigation methods, sampling theory in general, was developed specifically to address well-known and serious deficiencies in traditional discrete sampling methods. So one thing we do in the next webinar, and we ended the, this webinar with, is let's go back and look at the MIELI site now. We have our discrete sample data. We've got some MIS data. How would we split the site up into individual DUs? And I'll show you this slide at the end, and you can download these from our web page. Uh, look at our web, webinar web page, Hawaii, here, and you can track down the, the uh, PowerPoint slides. So the, the previous discrete and DUMIS data are, again, were used in, in, rea in real life to complete a site characterization and optimize remedial actions at the site. They're out there finishing the site this week, removing soil. The objective from our office, the objective for cleaning up the site was that the mean or true concentration of PCBs uh, for any given 5,000 square foot area, it's a hypothetical house lot, six inches deep, it's about 100 cubic yards, had to be less than 1.2 ppm. So if anyone went out to the site in the future and randomly put a 5,000 square foot uh, decision unit area or fake house lot on the site, that was their goal, PCBs less than 1.2 ppm. Or if they dug up all this soil and it was in a huge stockpile, you wanted to know if you could reuse the soil, that's it. You split the stockpile up into 100 cubic yard decision units, collect multi increment sample from each one, replicates and some. And that would be the goal again. The PCBs have to, should be less than 1.2 ppm. The soil greater than 50 ppm is less than 50 ppm when it's going to a municipal landfill. Unfortunately, on the mainland, the landfill here won't take it because we still haven't gotten agreement from the TOSC office, US EPA, to use MIS data for disposal purposes. So it's going to cost them a lot of money. Soil greater than 50 ppm up front was going to a TOSC approved landfill on the mainland. Uh, again, this is all going to be based on MIS data. This project's being run by the Navy so they don't have to follow the discrete sampling guidance in TOSCA. And actually, no one has to. There's a caveat in TOSCA that says you can propose alternative methods to characterize and you know, remediate and dispose of soil under the risk-based option in TOSCA. That's what we're waiting to get concurrence with. And that's where MIS would fit under. So what does this 50 ppm number mean? And again, what do these concentrations mean, these screening levels mean? You have to think about that up front. Again, they were never intended to apply to individual particles of soil or individual jars random handfuls of dirt in a jar of soil. They were always meant to be protective of human health in this case, right? or in this case, if you're taking the soil to a landfill, the 50 ppm limit was intended to minimize exposure risk to municipal landfill workers and impacts to groundwater. So again, what's our 
decisioned area for a landfill. Well, we talked to the landfills. The main concern there is they're bringing in this soil, which they think is clean in terms of landfill use, and they're using it for daily cover. At the end of the day, you cover the garbage with a layer of dirt. They're concerned the workers could be exposed to the, the soil here. In this case, the average area where they'd be placing a landfill is about a half an acre, and they put it about 12 inches deep. So that's about 400 cubic yards. So what we should be using this 50 ppm number four, uh, what we want to ensure is that no 400 cubic yard volume of soil goes to the landfill with a concentration of PCBs greater than 50 ppm. It, if, you, if you could test that entire 400 cubic yards, it's a single sample. So that's the maximum decision at volume for a soil in Hawaii that you can send to a landfill, 400 cubic yards. It's based on risk, as it all should be. In, in general, for these cleanup sites, like we're looking at here, the volume of soil actually tested is at most maybe a few hundred cubic yards or maybe a few tens of cubic yards because you really want to isolate what the contaminated soil is. Again, we talk about that in our webinars. So at the end of this webinar, then kind of fill in your own remedial investigation to use. Here's the site again. The white box here is the five acre site where the broadcasting station was. So think about this. How would you split up this five acre site into these units for further testing? to clean up the site and ultimately you want to make sure that no 5,000 square foot area within this 5 acre area has a concentration of PCBs greater than 1.2 ppm is our cleanup level. The red outlined area here is is the the inner area where we know we have heavy PCB contamination. The blue outlined area, the dotted area here is where they did their discrete soil sample study. So we have a lot of good useful discrete data in here. Again it's useful if you know how to use it. The green box here is where the, our office did our discrete sample study and multi-increment sample study in 2012. So think about how you would divide these up. And if you're if you're watching this on the YouTube video or if you have the slides, then just look at this and think about it for a while. Kind of, I'd print it out and just practice, start splitting it up. Just to give you some hints, you can look at our guidance. Where you think you have heavy contamination, it's going to cost a lot of money to ship this soil to the mainland. $1,200 per ton. Uh, a ton is about one backhoe bucket full of dump truck you see 10 tons. So you, where you think you have heavy contamination you want to split it up into small decision it's small volume so you can really isolate he areas of heavy contamination and not waste a lot of money mixing hot areas with uncontaminated areas. Now a lot of people think oh you're diluting it out but what you're really doing is you're contaminating un uncontaminated areas you're, you're biasing them to be contaminated. It's never in anyone's interest in the field to mix spill area samples from spill areas with, uh, say, soil from suspect clean areas, because ultimately they're just going to end up with more contaminated dirt. It's a kind of a fallacy I think a lot of us regulators used to have. So here's a here's a, a slide here. They actually did this at a site behind all these colored boxes are their decision units. I'm not going to show you in this presentation or in the slides we post to the web page. We'll look at those in the next webinar. Just to give you a little bit of idea, you know, a place to start. Start dividing these the blue area up which we think is less PCB contamination away from here because it's away from the core area of contamination. This brown area we're starting to get a little worried about, maybe a little smaller to use there. And then in here where the discrete sample study they carried out was, where we know we have a lot of PCB contamination. You want to keep your DUs pretty small because that's you want to isolate the contamination and save money on it. Here's a, something to throw in for the next webinar. This blue spot here is where the the company set up was going to set up their staging area to do the excavation here because and based on the discrete sample data it looked like it was pretty clean. So uh, they were about to set it up and someone in the from Hawaii here said you know you may want to go back and test your staging area to collect some MI samples there just to be sure it's clean. And I'll let you guess whether or not you think it came out clean or not. So that's it. We'll end with this slide just for general questions. This is a, a great quote I just heard from one of Neil deGrasse Tyson's videos he has posted to YouTube. Is uh, I look at the problems that surround us today and there are problems yet to be identified because they only show up after we've learned to even ask such questions. That's really what happened to us in, in soil sampling over the last 10 years. And I like his take on That's what excites me about the entire moving frontier of science. And once you start catching on and once you get through that anger, denial, or denial, anger, however it goes, depression stage, and you, you slowly get through the compromise stage and get to the acceptance stage. It's really fun. And some of the questions that were asked here, the, the first obvious question, and I think people 
get this pretty quickly was all these decision units. Where do we start? How do we start splitting a site up into decision units? And so some people know I've been uh, I've been working with in China on the same thing. They saw some of our guidance and presentations. We've already translated our guidance into into Chinese. So I spent six months over there. And the same question there. And they have huge sites, square kilometers, some of them. How do you split a site that's three square kilometers up, multiple factories and such in it, into decisions for testing? So where do you start? Well, here's where you start. You start with one DU. You draw a line around your site, and that you're, you have one single DU. You're going to collect one single sample from that area, no matter how big it is. Uh, that's probably not going to be satisfactory for most people. So what you do is you get your risk assessors together. You get your field people together, you get your remediation people together, and you start progressively splitting the site up into smaller and smaller DUs. And eventually you're going to get to a point where everyone's satisfied. The, answer, the questions they have about risk or about optimizing remediation are going to be answered. And what you're going to find out is, is these areas where you're going to designate a single decision units are areas where you might in the past have collected a single discrete sample. And that's the, where we get confused in the compromise stage of this is, well, discrete samples are better in some cases because we need to identify where the hot areas are, where the hot spots are. Well, I just showed you how unreliable that is. What you're really doing is, you're in your mind, you're splitting the site up into separate areas for testing. So you're already s splitting the site up into decision units. You just weren't, and you, I'm speaking to myself too, weren't collecting a proper representative sample from that area. It's test instead of testing a single random handful of dirt in a jar from that area, targeted area, now we know you draw a line around that area, you collect a single sample from at least, say, 30, 50, 75 points, minimum 1, 2 milligrams, the lab processes and such. So now when you do this, the data you get back from the laboratory is going to be representative of the sample you sent them, because they processed it and subsampled it. The sample you sent them, if you did it, collected it adequately in the field, is going to be representative of that targeted area. So real quickly, you'll be surprised how fast you start finishing characterizing sites that normally would have taken years to do. That was one one of the questions. The second question that came up was, "What about all the laboratories? You know, that are they set up to do this? Are we going to overwhelm them with multi-increment samples before they can get set up? Because typically you're going to have a dedicated room to air dry and process these samples, and that is going to be a problem. I and mean, you need to track down a laboratory in your area. And I bet there's some in your area, even on the East Coast. They're doing a lot of this in the West Coast and other parts of the U.S. But a lot of laboratories have already set up these." processing abilities to collect and test MI samples. And Test America is one of them. They have laboratories all over the U.S. and they have a person dedicated to training people on how to do this. So why are they doing this? If you think about it, and I tell my colleagues in California, and I used to work for California EPA, I said, think about it. Call the labs there. They're overwhelmed with multi-increment sample processing. And But think about it. None of the regulatory agencies in California require it. So who's requiring, why are they out there collecting these multi-increment samples? Well, it's because the banks and the attorneys are catching on. A lot of consultants are catching on and some of the regulators. And the banks in particular aren't going to finance any kind of property transaction based on discrete sample data. And that's really where this is headed. So very quietly, even sites that have been closed, consultants, the finance institutions, lawyers and such are going back and getting consultants to retest them, collect multi-increment samples, and then they'll base their decision on that. And you, you'll see, and we've seen this, some of these sites that were NFA'd by the regulatory agencies and they're in the middle of a property transaction, well, the, the buyer uh, just quietly walks away for no reason. A lot of times this is what's going on. So that's it. And I know we covered a lot of material. In the next webinar, part two, we'll look at more detail at the Voice of America site, maybe review a few key points here, but get into the more fun of it. How do you actually apply this at a site? And what are some of the lessons learned? Would they divide the area up, area up in the same DUs as they did initially for testing or after the fact would they do things a little bit different which is almost always the case. How about that staging area? Was it was it really clean or did they have to move it? I'll let you guess. So thanks a lot and uh, looking forward to you joining us for a part two webinar. This is August 30th 2018. The next webinar will probably be sometime in October. Thanks. <coughs>